Hello everyone, welcome to the CILE conference, the end of Pax Americana and the role of ASEAN in Singapore. My name is Tan Sien Li and I am the CIL co-director of the ASEAN Law and Policy Programme. It is my great pleasure to welcome my good friend, Professor Joseph Weiler, the other co-director of CIL's ASEAN Law and Policy Programme to share with us his insights on the changes in American power in the world order and how this impacts us in the ASEAN region and also in Singapore. This e-conference will last approximately 60 minutes, including a question and answer segment at the end. Throughout the event, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So over to you, Joseph. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure and an honor and a privilege to be here. You can see that compared to the slide, I'm quite a bit older, quite a bit grayer, and quite a bit fatter. But uh, it's always a pleasure to participate in CIL uh, events. Now, many of you might think that this presentation is a Trump-driven uh, phenomenon. It's not. At most, uh, in my view, the current administration is highlighting, accentuating, and maybe in some respects aggravating a process which predates it. And to underscore this point, I'm going to arrange my talk as follows. I will start by briefly clarifying what I mean by the Pax Americana, explain its principal features, and I will even date it. Uh, in this respect, maybe I can drop a footnote uh, in a, this type of presentation, especially when it's online, especially when it's on Zoom, I adopt what I always think should be the masthead of the Economist magazine, simplify and exaggerate. So I will be simplifying, I will be exaggerating, but in the Q&A, one can introduce some nuance and one can flesh out some arguments. So first I will explain what is, what I think, uh, the Pax Americana was. I'll then explain and subsequently demonstrate what I mean by the end of the Pax Americana and the causes for that. Now, already now I want to make a short, clear. We're not talking about a rupture. Uh, it's not an end of empire phenomenon like uh, Great Britain within 15 years becoming Little England. Uh, with the collapse of its empire in uh, the late 40s, early 50s, and beginning of the 60s of the last century. Uh, the United States remains a superpower, uh, militarily, economically, politically. Uh, it's a determined nation. In some respects, it's a nation of warriors. Woe to those who mess with it directly. But uh, the end of the Pax Americana can be described as an erosion in world affairs of the American ability or the United States ability to shape, to constrain, and to contain uh, world events. And the basic thesis is that at a certain point, this erosion uh, shifts from a difference in degree to a difference in kind, and hence the end of the Pax Americana. Uh, importantly, as I said, when I make, when I demonstrate this, I will at first confine myself to events which took, took place before the current administration, and only then will I make some specific observations of how the Trump administration is relating to this phenomenon. In the final part of the the presentation, I will talk about what has been the world's reaction and where does one situate uh, ASEAN and Singapore. So the Pax Americana, I would date it as its starting point, the First World War, uh, 1914. 
and it comes to an end more or less whereby the erosion becomes from a difference of degree to a difference of kind a hundred years later, sometimes around 2013, 14, 15, etc. Uh, thinking for a minute about the role of the United States in the First World War gives us a key to understanding the Pax Americana. It's all there. Uh, in the First World War, it was not so much the contribution of the United States in military terms, although it was quite incisive, uh, but it was the huge impact that the United States had in reshaping the world after the First World War. If we think of Wilson's 14 points, uh, basically it brought about the dismantling of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And the principle of self-determination, which at that point was not a principle of international law, it was a policy statement, is one of the things that had huge impact way beyond the end of the First World War. It uh, endures and explains the emergence of a new world after the Second World War, but the seeds were sown by Wilson uh, in the termination of the First World War. And here one sees a feature of the Pax Americana. As we would expect, it's a combination of American self-interest. Uh, it has to be. Uh, no country acts totally altruistically or even predominantly altruistically. It's the responsibility of governments to take care first and foremost of the national interest. But there always has been in American foreign policy a strong altruistic element. The mixture differs, but there was no the primary cause for American inter intervention in the First World War cannot be reduced. It was in the American national interest, although there was a national interest. It was also assuming responsibility to what the world would be and asserting American leadership in doing such, not only in the interest of the United States, but in the interest of what the United States considered to be the interest of the world. And that characterizes the hundred years of the Pax Americana. We always have that mixture of self-interest and a certain measure of idealism and altruism uh, throughout the era of the Pax Americana. Uh, it comes to a certain peak at the end of the Cold War because it was perceived or presented in some ways as a victory for the vision of the United States of the world and for at least a decade or two, we lived in a world where there was only one superpower, the United States. And it seemed as if American values had prevailed. You remember all the talk about the end of history and all that. And then slowly it, began, it begins to dismantle and to erode. So let me give you some uh, just signposts, little memory jerkers, reminders where we can see the erosion of that huge American domination, which in a way was at its peak at the end of the, of the Cold War, the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. Uh, so let's fast forward to 2008, 2009, 2010, et cetera. Uh, already there, there's some indication because the financial collapse in 2008, a little bit unfairly, but was attributed to American mismanagement of uh, its economy, especially financial markets, the subpar mortgages, etc. Uh, it certainly precipitated the economic crisis of 2008, but it also exposed serious weaknesses in monetary and, and fiscal management of other areas of the world including Europe and Asia. But then let's look at some other examples. Uh, a policy in that period was resetting relations with Russia. It didn't really work. All the resetting of relations with Russia, uh, we if not in a cold war, we in a cool war, although a footnote about Trump in a minute about that. Uh, just think of Crimea. Uh, 
it would be something that previously the United States would really uh, perhaps even have the power to prevent, to contain, to contain, to constrain, but it's a fait accompli. Arab Spring, hugely important event or potentially important event. The United States was AWOL, absent without leave, both in its unfolding and eventually in its demise. The United States played a minor role in the Arab Spring. If we look at the never-ending Arab-Israeli conflict, and I remind you, I'm leading up to it's the pre-Trump era. Uh, who doesn't remember the famous speech of Obama in Cairo? There will be an end to the settlements, etc. None of that happened. Uh, America leadership, leadership role in relation to the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, was another AWOL, uh, absent uh, without leave. Think of Syria. And the red line in the, the sand, this we will not allow, this we will not allow. And uh, whatever way you define American interest in the Syria conflict, it hasn't been a great success. Uh, the post-Iran and Afghanistan saga, once again, I give these as example of erosion of American uh, shaping power, constraining power, containing power. It's not a particularly happy story. Uh, if we move to the econ economics, so both the collapse of the TTIP, which was meant to reset and pacify trade relations between, the Euro between Europe and the United States, and also T -T TPP, and I remind you that Hillary Clinton turned her back on TPP even before the election of Trump, so that the outcome which we now live with would have probably been uh, the same. And if I just give you one more example as illustrating a fairly rapid erosion in American shaping, constraining, and containing power, just think about America and Africa. And here, if I can say with a, a certain twinkle in my mind, in my eye, America and Africa, how do you spell that in Chinese? So if I persuaded you that there's some merit to think of the end of the Pax Americana, let's talk for a few minutes about its causes. Uh, so usually we say politics first, and because politics first, I'm gonna speak about economics because in terms of power, economics is power. It's not just prosperity and counting money and bank accounts and trade balances, et cetera. In a non-bellicose world, in the sense that, well, in a world that is not uh, totally engulfed by war, the measure of power of influence is often reduced to economic might. So the United States is still formidable by uh, any economic indicator. It's a powerful economy. But economics and trade are a relative game. And already for a long time, the United States, for a very long time, the United States in most areas of production, industrial production, has lost its uh, previous primacy. Its economy, with some big exceptions, uh, military hardware, large body airplanes, uh, is more a service oriented economy audiovisual, financial services, et cetera. But the real leverage, and people forget that, the real leverage that the United States has and had economically is its huge, not production power, but consumption power. Uh, there was a time where two thirds of industrial goods produced in the world were sucked up by the American economy. And this consumption power is what gives you economic leverage. You can play with tariffs, you can close markets. We, we've been seeing this play out in the last few years. So consumption power is where we can really translate economic might in a very tangible way into power leverage, et cetera. And what has happened is, it's not just, it's not that the American economy has become less voracious. Uh, it still is voracious, but the emergence of China, India, and some of the BRICS, 
Uh, China today is not just a production powerhouse, it's also a consumption powerhouse. And increasingly, that is the situation in India, uh, for some time Brazil, etc. But if I just focus on China and India, uh, maybe even 20 years ago, not more than 20 years ago, if a producer of industrial goods anywhere in the world had to choose, do I lose the American market or do I lose the Chinese market? It would be a, no, a no-brainer. Within two seconds, they would say, I want to keep the American market. That's where I make my biggest profits, etc. Today, it's not clear what the answer would be in many, many industries. And as I say, it's not, and I repeat, I apologize, it's not just we always think of China as the factory of the world. It's China increasingly the big consumer, like the United States, like the European Union, which gives it uh, that kind of leverage. Uh, in this connection, I want to mention demographics because one doesn't see demographics uh, discussed so much in IR literature, international relation literature, and not so much in the various studies and essays and books about the decline of this or the decline of that. But demographics have a very important role to play. American population, it's still positively growing, but it's 300 million. Now, if we're still in the realm of economics and economic leverage and economic power and alliances and states calculating where their interests lie, 300 more or less prosperous American uh, residents, citizens, consumers, are probably more important than even one billion or one and a half billion of very poor, hardly consuming Chinese or Indians or some other states. But when prosperity is spreading very fast, uh, these countries are becoming more and more affluent. And as they become more and more affluent, the economic power through production and consumption grows then suddenly demographics, and we're not just talking about in military terms, you know, who has a bigger army, et cetera, but I'm still confining myself to the politics of economics, demographics become incredibly important. And suddenly the difference between 300 million and one and a half billion or more or somewhat less becomes critical in assessing projection of power, potential of power, evolution of power, etc. So the demographics is also a factor which explains the erosion that I talked about before, which I claim translated into the Pax Americana. Uh, I want to talk now explicitly about politics, but internal politics. I think uh, two things have changed dramatically in, within the United States, which are germane to our discussion. Uh, the first thing, you remember Clinton's famous statement, it's the economy stupid. In other words, the way to American uh, voters was through their pocketbook, through their pocket. Uh, when they felt prosperity, etc., you got their votes. I think today we could perhaps a little bit, I said, simplify, exaggerate. We could say it's, the, it's identity stupid. Identity politics in the sense both of uh, what it means to be an American, who are Americans. Look at the shift in the United States over the last 20 years of attitudes towards immigration. The so-called undocumented immigrants, the illegal immigrants in the United States, which are counted in the millions and millions, it's a benign policy of both Democrat and Republican administrations. They turned a blind eye because it served the American economy. It still serves the American economy, but it's become an identitarian issue and therefore a polarizing factor. And identity also goes to uh, how we feel about ourselves as a collectivity rather than how I feel about myself as uh, an earner, as an employed or unemployed person, about the prosperity of my family, etc. And this has resulted 
in a high degree of polarization, which has had two consequences which impact uh, the projection of American power. So first of all, internal American politics have become increasingly dysfunctional. Uh, when we have a system of governments which can have a democratic house and a Republican president, or a democratic president and a Republican house and Senate, the management of policy, the management, the business of governance becomes very, very complicated. And uh, we can see it playing in front of our eyes now, but you could also see it in previous administrations. So I will give an example for a previous administration where the United States was on the brink of declaring uh, a technical default on its debt. Now, nobody took that too seriously because the underlying fundamentals were that American was not insolvent. It just was a political problem. But the political problem was significant because suddenly the most safe paper in the world, an American treasury bond, was called into question. Uh, and polarization also means that it used to be the case, of course, with some clamorous exceptions like the Vietnam War. But on the whole, despite sharp domestic differences in the management of internal American politics, there used to be consensus about foreign policy, certainly during the Cold War, etc. And that has come to an end so that today even foreign policy is a very polarizing factor in American politics. And obviously that spills over into the ability credibly to project uh, uh, American power to contain, to constrain, to shape. Uh, take one example, the way one administration can walk away from the agreements negotiated by a previous administration. One administration will sign a treaty, the previous administration will withdraw from that treaty, et cetera. That is a very debilitating, and it really hurts American credibility as a reliable world power with a spillover effect into the shaping, constraining, and containing ability of the United States. And finally, in explaining the erosion uh, of these uh, three factors in American foreign policy, there's the issue of moral authority. Uh, it was almost taken for granted with all the foibles of American foreign policy, with its interventions in Latin America, et cetera, throughout the Cold War. First of all, America saved, and it gave it credit forever, saved uh, the free world in the Second World War, both in Asia and uh, in uh, Europe. I think that's a memory which many today in Singapore might still have. Uh, it was the United States defeat of Japan. Uh, and then throughout the Cold War, it was the defender of the so-called free world. We can take issue with many particular steps of America during the Cold War, but it still had that kind of mobilizing moral authority, standing for democracy, standing for the free world. Uh, etc. With the end of the Cold War, that kind of legitimating uh, factor of America as a country and of American foreign policy erodes pretty quickly. And then a much more critical outlook from a moral point of view, and I just say from a moral point of view, and I'm also talking about perceptions. So one can argue about the fundamentals, but in terms of perception, uh, Iraq, the war itself, Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, etc., very, very seriously weakened American moral prestige and the ability of the United States uh, to speak not only in terms of realpolitik, but also as representing an idealist power or an ideal of a free democratic world which respects rights, etc. And each one of you will have many more examples, but I add to the economic, to the political, also the moral authority of the United States, which also uh, erodes. So just to see where we are in this presentation, 
I explained what I meant by the Pax Americana. I gave some examples from the last 10 years of the erosion of American power to shape, contain, and constrain and contain. And I gave uh, a short explanation of the structural reasons which explain this kind of erosion, both within the United States polity, but also we living in a different world where relative power is the key, not absolute power. So now I do come and I want to say, just make a few observations about the current administration and Trump. Uh, so first of all, I'm hoping that in some ways I can give you an additional key to understand some of the current American policy. Uh, because in some way, Mr. Trump, my president, is reacting to the exact phenomenon that I described. Uh, I called it the end of the Pax Americana, looking at it from a global perspective from the outside, but looking from the inside, it just translating to America is less powerful. Uh, and therefore, making America great again in some ways is a reaction to the processes that I've described in the last few minutes. And in some ways, if you feel like I do, that all things told, uh, there was some benefit in the Pax Americana in terms of stability and so forth, uh, you might uh, have some th sympathy if the agenda can be described as restoring the Pax Americana, restoring American credibility, uh, et cetera. But there's a huge but here. And it's not happening in that way, even if it might be the motivation, domestic politics apart, it's not working out quite in the way one might have uh, thought or hoped for. First of all, it's not at all clear from my presentation that it's possible to restore the Pax Americana because it doesn't depend on discrete foreign policy decisions. I gave several structural reasons, just to remind you of one example, demographics, which suggests that it's a new world and we just have to get used to the idea and Americans have to get used to the idea and the American administration that that world of United States dominance and domination and the Pax Americana is over for good and it cannot be restored because the reasons are structural and not just policy determined. So that's one consideration. Second consideration is there's a certain confrontational style in the current administration. Now, uh, Realpolitik will teach us that sometimes confrontation is essential, is necessary. You can't just lie down and take it. But what characterizes or one of the features of the confrontations, confrontational style of the current administration, it's con confrontation with foe and friend alike. In other words, if you're going to confront a foe, you want to have your friends and allies alongside you. That was one of, if one can talk about it, the genius of American foreign policy was that it always managed to build very serious alliances in its foreign policy objectives. But when you confront both your friends, both your foes and your friends, uh, you don't project power. And your ability to shape, constrain, contain is uh, significantly reduced. If we just think about the very, very troubled relationship between the United States and Europe, I cannot think, and I've been a student of this for the last 40 years, I cannot think of a lower point in American-European relations than currently. And some of it, not all of it, but some of it goes to the manner in which American objectives in Europe are being prosecuted rather than the substance. America is right to demand a greater commitment to defense, for example, from some of the NATO partners. But there's a different way of doing it. And when you lose your ally, when you lose your friends, or when they have to sort of uh, tighten their mouths because you can't really confront the United States, you're not acting. Uh, it's not a good way to uh, restore uh, 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 the previous kind of Pax Americana that we had. And then uh, 
there's one thing that you can put down to either rhetoric or substance. But even if we take it as rhetoric, a, a banal secret of effective foreign policy is to present a national interest as a collective good. It's not because it's good for France, it's good for Europe. It's not because it's good for Germany, because it's good for Europe. You can think, you can fill in the gaps there. When the American message is America first, you lose that mobilizing factor because then you're declaring to the world, I'm not concerned with the world, I'm concerned with America first. And if it's not only rhetoric, and in some respects it's possible to interpret American actions under the current administration as truly American first and get lost, I said I'm simplifying and I'm exaggerating, uh, then it's not going to work. And instead of restoring, it will accentuate and aggravate uh, and aggravate the, 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 the end of the Pax Americana. Uh, and one cannot have a talk these days, and I've managed for the last uh, 25 minutes uh, without mentioning COVID, uh, the mismanagement, and I think it is mismanagement, of the COVID situation in the United States has not added to American prestige. It's tarnished American prestige. So now reactions, uh, including ASEAN and Singapore. So my claim is that there is a vacuum, that the Pax Americana has really come to an end and that there is a vacuum that previously was filled by it. And what are the reactions? So for the most part, the world is still flailing apart, flailing around, trying to get used to uh, understand it and develop strategies, policies. So how do we manage a, a world where that constant feature, in some respects stabilizing, is no longer there and maybe even now is destabilizing. And it's in some ways each country to its own. So we even see within the European Union deep fissures in relation to foreign policy, relationship with China, think of the flap between Italy and the rest, uh, think about the uh, North Stream gas pipe uh, with Germany, uh, because it's each country really sort of trying to adjust to this situation, and it's having this kind of spillover destabilizing effect. So that is descriptive. Now I want to be uh, speculative. It might be that there's room for something that looks like, but is not at all like, uh, during the Cold War, uh, the non-aligned group. Uh, you remember the group of 77s. The group of 77, which had more than 77 states, which positioned themselves as non-aligned between uh, the first world, the United States and its allies, and the second world, the Soviet Union and its allies. Now, why do I say this will be very different? And let's, instead of call them non-aligned, we might want to call them the multilateralist. Uh, because think of a potential configuration. Uh, leaders of such a kind of emerging international relations might be Europe, which previously was staunchly with the United States, but might not, now might be a leader of a world grouping, which for convenience I call the multilateralist. Uh, organizations and states like ASEAN, some groupings in Latin America, etc. And there, the purpose of this would be, first of all, to advance and protect the multilateral agenda in a world which is becoming increasingly polarized. Uh, but also to give cover to each other, because it's hard to stand up on your own, but if you're part of that kind of grouping, which, uh, again, simplifying, exaggerating, trying to advance a rational policy for the world which is mutually beneficial, etc., cetera, uh, it's easier to do it when you're part of a group than standing alone. Uh, am I saying this will happen? I'm not, but, it is a possibility and it's an interesting possibility if it should be advanced. Let's turn finally to Singapore. Uh, 
In international relation terms, Singapore is a remarkable success story by any criteria. It joy, enjoys universal respect, which few states of similar size, and by size, I mean both territory and population enjoy. Uh, interestingly, if I come to the current situation, uh, in its case, cold realpolitik happens to coincide with an idealistic vision of international relations. What do I mean by this? Given its small size, given its history, given the circumstances of its birth, uh, its relatively small populations, its very small territory, it doesn't have an inter a hinterland, uh, it's the strategic, a strategic interest of Singapore is in an international order based on multilateralism, open trade, and the rule of law. Uh, that is not idealism, that is a strategic interest of Singapore, multilateralism, open trade, and the rule of law. But it just also happens to be what many would consider uh, a good, ideal vision for the world order as a whole. Uh, if prosperity is shifting, uh, in Singapore as well, from manufacturing to services, financial services, legal services, arbitration, port services, tourism, real estate investment hub, then all argue for the above. Open trade, multilateralism, rule of law. Now, I would also add one thing. From a Singapore point of view, ASEAN has been a very interesting success, less in the economic sphere. Uh, with due respect to some colleagues who disagree with me, I think that the contribution of ASEAN directly, specifically, to Singapore prosperity is limited. But politically, it's been a huge success in two ways. It diffused in a remarkable way historical tensions associated with Singapore's birth, and it introduced a culture of conversation among states with often conflicting interests, uh, the way the relationship is managed, ASEAN provides a very, very interesting fra framework, which regularly, because of habit, pours oil on any potential conflict. Now, in, uh, in concrete terms, this is where I see the main strategic challenge for Singapore in the wake of the end of the Pax Americana. On the one hand, Singapore has a security interest, uh, just think South China Sea, et cetera, where wanted or not, it still needs, depends on uh, American power. If American military power and political resolve were totally to dissolve, uh, I think uh, security, those responsible for security interest in Singapore would be extremely worried. On the other hand, Singapore just can't afford and shouldn't afford uh, to be in a conflictual uh, relationship with China. And I don't have to explain why that is so. Uh, the Singaporean interest in Pacific relations, in healthy relations, in powerful economic relations with China for a whole variety of interests that the specific list listeners of this presentation today do not need repeating is paramount. So you can see how these two strategic interests can play out in a very challenging way. If we can imagine an escalation uh, of American-Chinese relationship, uh, America might call on Singapore to display its loyalty, alliance ship, et cetera, and that would come into conflict with uh, the other strategic interest, the absolute imperative of uh, a good relationship with China and vice versa. And this leads me to, to think that, of course, Singapore has had always a very sophisticated uh, foreign policy and diplomacy, and it will continue to do so in terms of taking care of its national interests. But also here, both the grouping of which I spoke before, 
in a more global sense, the multilateralist. And ASEAN might be a very useful vehicle for Singapore to manage this potential tension between its security interests, which are United States related in some ways, if push comes to shove, and its social, economic, political interests in the region, which are China directed. ASEAN might be uh, a very good vehicle to shield Singapore from some uh, abject pressures that might come from these two superpowers. And I conclude by saying that Singapore, in my view, has always been at its best when it led from behind, not from the forefront. Thank you. And of course, I'm open to questions, challenges, criticism. I hope I haven't made too many people angry. Well, thank you very much, Joseph. So we have actually quite a number of questions and comments, um, and I will take a few of them together. So from Michelle Zhang and Simon Tay, uh, coming from New Zealand and Singapore, respectively, the general question they ask is, you know, given the current confrontation between the China and uh, between China and the U.S., um, what type of ramification shall we? see in the short term or in the medium term, what does this mean in terms of, you know, uh, global politics and also in international trade? And of course, for, you know, smaller or medium sized countries in ASEAN. So I think I addressed it in some ways in the final uh, comments I made in my presentation that if this confrontation uh, escalates, it has a ripple effect because American uh, trade confrontation is not only with China. There's also significant confrontation uh, with the European Union. And here is a truism, but it's a very important truism that any reduction in the overall volume of world trade harms everybody. And if American markets close down or become reduced, et cetera, everybody suffers uh, because it's still one of the two most or three most important market destination, uh, primarily for industrial goods, but also for, in a certain measure, increasingly agricultural goods, et cetera. So there is an interest in trying to play a role in de-escalating the tensions between, uh, say, China and the United States uh, from a total self-interest. But small and medium states, I think, on their own can play a very limited role in that and might find themselves be called upon to take sides. And that would probably be the worst outcome because taking sides is uh, not a win-lose. It's certainly not a win-win. It might end up to be a lose-lose. And that's why I thought that any kind of collective action uh, by ASEAN, by broader uh, Asian uh, uh, aggregates, if you want to say, and even across uh, the seas, together with, say, the European Union, would help play this role, de-escalate tensions between China, China and the United States and uh, give some kind of shield that prevents, that doesn't push P, uh, states, for example, like Singapore, openly to take sides in that conflict. Uh, right. I'm sorry so, I can't be more precise, but that's my generally the way I'm thinking about it. All right. So there are also questions which refer to, you know, the to your talk on the, the end of Pax Americana. So, is this change irreversible? I think you mentioned that during your talk that there is this trajectory, that there is this decline. So if this is irreversible, is there permanent damage to the international order as we know it? And what do you think the, well, I mean, this is predictive, but what do you think the outcome would be? So what I think is irreversible is there's no way the United States can reattain the kind of dominance and domination in the eyes of some uh, that it had during the Pax Americana. Uh, 
And that's because I said it's not dependent on specific foreign policy decisions of the United yeah. States. There's structural reasons, uh, which I explained and I won't repeat. What could be different is how one manages that. And there, American policy can take uh, different directions. And I already hinted uh, in my limited un understanding, my preference is that the current administration is probably making, you have to choose your foes and choose your friends. You can't make all your friends into foes. You can't be confrontation with, with everybody. So if instead of, sorry to be a bit glib, making America great again, it's how does America manage a new world order in which its relative power for good or for worse is not the same and will not be the same, one can manage the new situation in a far superior way than I think it's being managed now. Although I do want to say there are some issues in which good people and true might agree with uh, the, the American position and the, the way America uh, is defining interests of itself and the world, although may not agree with the manner in which it goes uh, about doing that. And there might be just too much where domestic agendas in the United States have too big an impact. Domestic agendas always have an impact on foreign policy. But what I see now in the United States in the wake of the end of the Pax Americana is that domestic agenda have too big a spillover into American rhetoric and American foreign policy. So all that can be different. Uh, but nobody should think that this process, if this process continues regardless of the outcome of the November elections. So uh, what might change is a different posture, different policy, different modes of managing the situation, but the situation itself in some ways is irreversible, uh, to overuse the word, but can be managed, can be contained. America will always, or at least for the foreseeable future, and I mean long-term foreseeable future, remain a hugely powerful uh, and important state. So it's not going to be like Great Britain becoming Little England. Right. So what you're saying is that there's this going to uh, there's going to be this balancing game for the very long term. So now I want to turn to a more international law um, or the history of international law question by someone, by a colleague, Rizwanul Islam from South Asia. And he asks, in the post Pax Americana world, do we, and in a more multipolar system, are we seeing something that's based on West failure, you know, the, the norms of West failure, or are we looking at more fragmented lawless systems? Well, first of all, that's a very clever way of posing the question. Are we returning to a uh, Westphalian type of order? Uh, and indeed, that's what I hinted when I sent if a new group would emerge, which resembles a bit, but is not at all like the group of non-aligned countries during the Cold War, I call them the multilateralists, because multilateralism in some way is uh, oppositional to a sort of hardline Westphalian uh, order, which is just coordinating national interests of states, uh, spheres of influence, etc. So that's the battleground. So the question defines well what is going to be the battleground. But an interesting phenomenon, and we see this since I emphasized economy, because hopefully we far from uh, a really bellicose, uh, God forbid, a third world war, etc. although one should keep that in the back of one's mind, but uh, since the, the main lines of confrontation are economic, what one sees and here I know that my view is iconoclastic. From the WTO point of view, uh, the, 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 the key solution is a truly global multilateral system. And they accept regional organization, regional trade agreements, of which today in the world there are about 400, uh, as an evil one has to live with 
but it really would be better if we had one global multilateral system. I'm not at all sure. So I think that uh, organizations like ASEAN, uh, like Mercosur, uh, et cetera, enable states to uh, develop the habit of cooperation, uh, of developing regional interests which do not necessarily coincide, coincide with global interests, of having more effective dispute, uh, deliber deliberative and dispute uh, resolution systems. So uh, I don't want to posit that either we become globally multilateral or it's doomsday and it's worst failure. There's a middle way that we see through the emergence, and I think it's a positive development, of regional organizations. It's very different from the Westphalian order, and I think there's considerable potential in uh, this type of phenomenon uh, going ahead. That's why it was regrettable that America turned its back on the TPP, but it's commendable that the remaining 11 went ahead and uh, stuck to the original plan. So there is some kind of middle way between the global multilateralism and a hardline Westphalia coordinating national interest. And that's represented by this turn to regional organizations, regional economic trade organizations and the like. Right. So I think we have 10 minutes more and time for maybe two large questions. So I want to turn the discussion back to countries. So one is the US and the other is Singapore. So let's take the group of Singapore questions first. Uh, so you mentioned just now that, you know, multilateralism or ASEAN helps to shield Singapore and helps to shape its uh, choices um, in terms of you know, politics and, and, and wider uh, issues. And also in this kind of context, what steps can Singapore take as, you know, a rule of law country and a very small country, you know, what can Singapore do to work within this fast changing and very tense environment? In, in some ways, Singapore's, and I say this, uh, there's a subtleness that I want to convey here. In, in some ways, Singapore's huge success by almost any criteria by which success can be measured, if we're looking at the parameters that I've been talking about, creates a certain, uh, uh, for want of a better word, weakness, because jealousy is not confined only to individual human beings. Uh, Singapore success can be irritating. So uh, what Singapore has to continue to do, and I think it's been a staple of its foreign policy, as I said, leading from behind, always encouraging this kind of Singapore is key in ASEAN, Singapore is key in other regional agreements. Uh, Singapore has got a very multilateral uh, outlook but also a multilateral way of doing things. They like doing things together with others. And really, that's the best kind of policy that uh, a country of the size of Singapore, uh, economically very important, geographically small, relatively small population, uh, probably has the military might to defend itself in, in, in case of aggression, but not to project power, et cetera. They, I think on the whole, they're doing the right thing and here, yeah, this American wisdom, if it works, don't fix it. I have no radical recommendation for Singapore. It's just more of the same and understanding that the responsibility of advancing this agenda becomes more imperative. And as I said, in the case of Singapore, many, more than many other countries, the sort of ideal vision of multilateralism, rule of law, et cetera, coincides in a very, very direct way with Singapore national interest. Erecting a new tariff barriers, etc. Singapore would be a country to suffer from that. Uh, so I don't have a recommendation to Singapore. It's just, if it works, don't fix it. More of the same with a sense of even greater responsibility that what you're doing is not only in the interest of Singapore, but also has a spillover effect to the challenges that the world faces. So no, no silver bullet, because I think on the whole, Singapore diplomacy and policy uh, 
has been wise. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then to the very last question on the U.S. So you know, at the the end of Pax Americana, you know, you talked about structural changes, historical transition, so on and so forth. So how much of this end of Pax Americana, if you can actually put a degree to it, is due to the long-term changes and how much is it due to Trump? And then the carryover question is, you know, so what can the rest of the world do? What, what specific strategies or international law strategies can we do to maneuver in this environment? I know all our questions have been talking about this maneuverability, but then perhaps you could answer it in relation to ASEAN. What can ASEAN do in this context? So I won't obfuscate. Uh, the reasons for Pax Americana are structural and are not Trump dependent. They were there, they would continue to be there, they were there under Obama. Uh, all the examples I gave were under the Obama or the Bush administrations and not under the Trump administration. So one should not point the finger at uh, the Trump administration and say you are responsible for the end of the Pax Americana. And then to repeat where I think one can have serious question marks is the way the current administration in the United States is managing this structural change. And it seems to be, uh, I know it's also driven simply by domestic politics, by the principle of re-election, et cetera, but it seems to be, in my view, a Sisyphean uh, target of trying to restore the past uh, in the present. And I think that is doomed for failure. And if that becomes the strategic objective, you might actually be damaging. Uh, instead of making, in terms of world uh, affairs, instead of making America great again, uh, even further diminishing its power, diminishing its prestige, diminishing the way the world looks up to the United States. So I think that's the division of labor in quotes uh, between the structural and the current American administration. The world has a tough act. The worst thing that the world can do and when talking about this in Europe, I say, you have to manage the United States. You can't isolate the United States. You can't emulate American policies of confrontation, etc. cetera. But on the, at the same time, you have to stand up to it. You can't just uh, be rolled over by an American largely domestic agenda and a foreign policy, which no longer follows the kind of understanding in the United States that they, indeed, it was world leadership they had to offer and not simply an aggressive prosecution of the national interest. How to do that is not easy. Even the European Union with all its might, for example, from a military point of view, they are just as dependent on the United States as uh, Singapore is dependent on the United States when it comes to hard power. Uh, Europe is totally mismanaged uh, its uh, security agenda. I give you one little statistic. If you take the collective uh, defense expenditure of all member states of the European Union, it's greater than Russia. But what you see for it is midget-like because of the mm -hmm. vision, different weapon systems, etc. Uh, so it's a tough act. But yeah, I'm afraid I can just repeat myself ad nauseum, ad tedium, so it's good that there's just three or four minutes left, uh, even Europe cannot do it on its own. Uh, it would be a mistake for Europe to try and emerge on its own as uh, a third pole between, uh, say, China, the United States. I don't know exactly where to position Russia in this respect. So Europe should try and give leadership, and the way I showed was in a very soft way, but discernible way, to try and be among the leaders of this in-between, uh, what we used to call non-aligned, we, we might still use it, although understanding it's very different. Uh, you have a difficult son or daughter, you don't throw them out of the house, you try and uh, keep them in. And Europe cannot just turn its back on the United States. It can't afford to do it, and it would not be in its interest to do it. So uh, the agenda should be multilateral, although taking care, of course, of the European interest as well, like all states do. 
but don't do it on your own. Understand that one is facing a problem and that collectively it's not only easier because in number there's strength, but also in numbers there is cover. It's easier not to take sides when you're part of a side that does not take sides. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, you know, your talk has been very rich and we, we've covered so much. I feel very um, exhausted by, you know, the volume and also the depth of doing our question and answer questions. So thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon. And to everyone who has tuned in, thank you very much for spending your Friday afternoon with us.